Hi, and welcome to Light on the Rock. I'm Philip Shields. The other day I was cleaning our glass sliding door and I wanted it to, I wanted to be really, really clean, crystal clear, perfect. And I thought I did a good job and I put everything away, put away all my cleaners and the sprayers, the paper towels and the cloths. And I was later on in the day, I was sitting down on the couch and the way the sun was setting, I saw this horrible streak that I had left on the glass. So guess what that meant? <clears throat> that meant that I'd go get all my stuff back out again, start all over on some of those spots because I couldn't stand it. I guess in a way, in some things I'm a perfectionist, but in other things, you know, it's not all that important. Like if I'm raking leaves and I know five or 10 or 20 more leaves are gonna fall when I'm all done cleaned up anyway, uh, I, I do come to a point where I feel like that's good enough. Now, I'll be thinking about this spiritually as I, as I begin this. I had a neighbor in Washington State. I went for a walk one time, and I could see him ahead of me, and he had a can of green paint in his hand, and he was spraying parts of his lawn that, before he sprayed, looked a little brown. And so I thought, boy, this will be good. What's going on here? And so I walked up, and he explained that he was. He was spraying his brown spots on his lawn, a nice shiny green, <laughs> because he said he had a friend coming in from another state who had a perfect lawn, and he just didn't want his lawn to look so bad. And so um, uh, he, that's what he did, he sprayed it. Now, was his lawn perfect after it was sprayed? Or was it more like what Jesus said to the Pharisees that you're like whitewashed tombs full of dead, men, <laughs> dead men's bones? It really was still brown grass that had just had a coating of green sprayed on it. So my question though, he wanted a perfect lawn. He wanted, he wanted it to be perfect. So my question for you, spiritually especially, are you a that'll do kind of person, that's good enough kind of person? Or are you the kind of person that uh, really wants to be a perfectionist and get it as close to perfect as at all possible? Or perhaps more realistically, you're more like I described me, that some things I have a that'll do attitude. I'm not gonna spend any more time on whatever that is. And then other times I will go and go and go until, until I think I, I've just about got it done perfectly. Now remember, God does tell us that whatever our hand finds to do, we'll put it up here on the board behind me here, whatever our hand finds to do, do the best we can. Do it with all your might. Be the best you can be. Uh, focus on getting better. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Uh, it says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of of God. It's a pleasure, of course, watching true craftsmen uh, do their craft. I was, we went to a um, crystal, to a crystal com company where they made crystal glasses and cups and so on, uh, glasses especially. And this one fellow had, he was hand engraving each glass, hand engraving, not by machine, making cuts on fine crystal, and they were beautiful. I enjoyed watching him. What a delight, someone who is a craftsman, a real master at what they do, what a delight to watch them. And I remember asking him, I said, how long did it take you to learn how to do it this well? And he kind of chuckled and he says, you never learn. He says, you just keep getting better and better. But anyway, interestingly enough, when you look at creation, whether you look through creation with telescopes going out way out there and looking up close that way and way out there, or whether you're using an, elect an electron microscope and getting down to the really gritty details of a leaf or a bug or anything that God's created, it just gets more and more perfect as you look at it. It's, it's just perfect because that's what God is. God is perfect. Now, if you have a Bible, you might want to turn to Matthew 5.48, or we'll put it up here. Matthew 5.48, did you realize God wants perfection from us and from you? Um, what does that mean? Matthew 5, 48 says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. You shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, keep that verse in mind, because this is going to be a two-part sermon. And I gave this at the feast in 2021. I've added some details here that I couldn't, didn't have time to put in at the feast. So I think this is going to be a better one. God in the highest 
looked down from heaven and somehow, some way, picked you for his own reasons to be in his first resurrection, to be in, among the leadership class of the people of his kingdom. Not because you and I bring so much to the table, but I think because he's merciful and he wanted to show what he could do even with people like you and me. You know, we're not part of the who's who. I was part of a who's who of high school students years ago, but uh, basically most of us, including me, instead of a, being in a book called Who's Who, we might be in a book called What's That? But anyway, God is wanting to do something with me and with you. It's going to be life-changing. It really will. If we will submit, open our eyes to what we've been called to do, and the end result is perfection, as God defines it, as we'll see. So no matter what you've done, even if you're hearing this from a prison cell because you murdered somebody, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been, no matter all the faults and sins of your life, no matter, when we listen to our Father's call and respond to it and say, yes, I'd be honored to be accepting your calling. I'd be honored to be in the first resurrection if that's where you want me to be. And yes, I want your way, the way. Yes, I will repent. Yes, I will turn around and go the right way. I will change. The power that you give me to change. And thank you for the high calling you've given me. He's called the least esteemed among mankind. Notice you and I weren't invited to the G20 meeting, <laughs> the, the, you know, all the heads of states. But Yeshua was a friend, remember, of tax collectors, the Republic, I mean, publicans, <laughs> not public, Republicans, but publicans, they were called tax collectors, women of ill repute, drunks and people that the Pharisees didn't want, didn't want anything to do with, he was a friend to them. And so let's respond to this call, understand we've been called to perfection. And the good news is that what Yeshua said, he paid his sin debt for you in Revelation 1, verse 5, in the second half of verse 5, that's what B means, Revelation 1, verse 5, it says he loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. He loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And he's giving us the freedom, the freedom to never again have to be a slave to Satan, to be owned by him. He's given us the freedom from the consequences of sins, the eternal consequences at least. And you've been called out of this world's ways to truly live, to truly live. Most of the people are alive, but they're not truly living. And so the Bible talks about how you who were once dead, he has made alive again. We'll talk about that in a future sermon. He's given us the power to stand up to Satan. He's given us the power to be victorious. And at the end, be perfect. Have you ever had a dream? Well, God's got a dream for you. And part of that is that in Romans 8, 29, it talks about how Yeshua, Jesus Christ, is the firstborn son of of many brethren. He's the firstborn of many. I want to be part of that many brethren. Romans 8, 29. Now we can push ourselves in physical areas to get better and better at things, but what about spiritually? Will attaining flawless, mature, complete, spiritual perfection end up being an act of God? Or is it something that we are going to attain if we try harder and harder and harder? But if we attain it, isn't that to our glory then at that point? If we attain it, who gets the glory? In other words, if we did it on our hard work, on our merits, will it be your doing that made you perfect or will it be God's doing? Will it be to your glory or to God's glory? I have a friend. I think he's moved somewhere in Missouri now or some other place. But he took this word perfect to mean the English definition of flawless as in a perfect, flawless diamond. And if we don't have a perfect track record, he says, over time, we simply won't be in the kingdom. 
I said, who do you know has done that besides Yeshua, besides Christ? And he thought for a while, he thought, I, I think my dad did. And I said, I knew your dad. Your dad was a very wonderful person. I think he'd be rolling over in his grave right now hearing you say that. Because, no, I, I don't think the rest of us have attained flawless performance perfection over time. But is that even the correct meaning of that verse? Is eventual perfection a result of all of our hard work? I don't think so. I really don't think so. So I'll show you in a minute what the Greek means. Anyway, I asked him how he was doing on this definition of perfect, flawless performance in living and how he was doing with his own life on it. And he said, well, he'd gotten up to two weeks of perfect living, and then he had a flaw, so he had to start over again. I said, well, good luck on that. Good luck on that. Anyone, has anyone ever been perfect? Has anyone ever been an exact copy of the Father? Be you perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, in Hebrews 1.3, we're told there was somebody who indeed was perfect. And um, God, who at various times, Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3, in various ways, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he's appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the worlds, who being the brightness, his Son was being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. The whole universe is held together, something to do with Yeshua, with Christ himself. And then when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, sat down, the job was, his job of what he had to do there was done. The NIV, the Berean, the National, I mean the NASB, all say um, the New American Standard, in other words, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Contemporary English version says he is like him, like God, in every way. Holman translation, he's the radiance of his glory, the exact expression of his nature. Now that is perfection. And he did it flawlessly all through his life. All I can say as I read that is, wow, wow, wow. So one man has lived flawlessly, and here's where we can find some clues that if we are in Christ, I think you'll see as I go through this in the next part, how that is what will attain us to that, get us to attain to perfection. So remember, Jesus was perfectly just like his father, and he was so perfect that even when they were trying to find fault with him, I know when he stood there before Pilate, for example, on the night on the eve of his crucifixion. <clears throat> three times, Pilate came out three times and said, I find no fault with this man. Three times. John 18, 38, John 19, 4, John 19, 6. Three times, no fault. And yet Hebrews 4, we're told in Hebrews 4, verses 14 and 15, that he was tempted in every possible way, and you know Satan and his spirit, evil spirits, would have been trying everything possible to get his mind off the gold, to get his mind, you know, he often had to say, I have to get, be doing my father's business. Even at age 12, didn't you know I had to be about my father's business, age 12. But he never gave in to, to the uh, sinful temptations. Temptations are not sin. Isn't that a relief? <laughs> Temptations are not sin. It's when we give in to the temptation or play the temptation over and over or start to get involved in it, now we're getting into the sin. So don't feel bad about being tempted because let's read it here. Seeing then, verse 14 of Hebrews 4, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession we don't have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points, all points, tempted, tried, tested, can mean different things, as we are, yet without sin. So one human, born as the Son of God, was able to live perfectly. So even my friend said, well, if one person, if one human could do it, it means that surely there could be a second and a third and a fourth 
Uh, yeah, I said, but he was son of God. He had some advantages. He had some advantages that I don't have and you don't have, if that helps you feel a little better. For example, he was begotten by his father, conceived in the womb of Mary by his father through the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1.20 and others say that. His dad, in other words, his father, his DNA, in other words, was from God the Father. Not a human father. That is huge. And someday I'll have to give a sermon on really exploring what that means. Jesus, that's also why he was, he was not a part, I'll just toss this much in for you to think about, that's also why he was not a part of the sin, Adam's sin that was passed on to mankind. In Romans 5, it says, through one man sin entered the world, and all sinned. Okay, Jesus literally was the Son of God in the highest. We will someday be full children of God as well, but not in the same way where he was conceived through the Holy Spirit from the very Father. Okay, and so, so he was man, but he was also God. And I can prove that because it would be a terrible sin to ever worship anyone or anything that wasn't God. Part of the God kind. Yeshua was worshipped from birth. Angels showed up. Shepherds worshipped. Eventually, wise men showed up sometime later. And they all worshipped. And there are many instances in the Bible, like the blind man in John 9, verses 35 to 38, when he found out who Yeshua was, he worshipped him. And Yeshua didn't stop him. Yeshua, of course, is Christ, Jesus. When the apostles when Paul, I think it was Silas or Barnabas, I think it was Barnabas, and they were trying to worship them in one of the cities they went to, they stopped it. Angels stop it when we try to worship them. So he was worshipped. He could remember, I'm talking about the advantages Yeshua had over you and me. He could remember his pre-birth heavenly life. John 17, verse 5, as he prayed in the evening of the Passover there, that he had with his disciples. John 17, 5, he called it the, the Passover, remember. Father, glorify me with the glory I had with you before the world was. Wow, now that's some memory. That would certainly inspire you. That would certainly motivate you in a way that you and I don't have. He said also, I saw Satan fall like lightning. When Satan tried to attack God in the past, he was slammed back. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and before Abraham was, I am. John 8. Remember, he is the Word. He's the one who wrote and inspired every word of the Bible. He also said that he had the power. He had the power to do it pretty much as he pleased, as long as it wasn't a sin. He could walk on water, right? He could hear people's thoughts. He knew people's thoughts. I'll put the scriptures up on that. Matthew 9, 4, and Luke 5, 22. And when uh, they came to arrest him in the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, and Peter got his sword out and hacked off the high priest's uh, ear, and Jesus healed that man too. Jesus, Yeshua, said, What are you doing? Don't you think that I could call 12 legions of angels if I had to? A legion was about 6,000 men in the Roman legion. 12 legions would be 72,000 angels. All you need would be one to help you out. <clears throat> 72,000? I don't have that kind of power and authority to command 72,000 angels to come, come to me. Some of you might disagree with what I just said. Maybe you think we do have that power, but I, I don't know any of you who are doing that. So anyway, let's get back to <clears throat> perfection. What does it mean? In English, like I said, it means flawless, uh, without being entirely without fault or defect, according to Webster's. Flawless, as in a perfect diamond. Webster's, being entirely without fault or defect. Fault, flawless, as in a perfect diamond. It goes on to say, faithfully reproducing the original, like letter perfect. Another definition is lacking in no essential detail. It's a complete. Now that's getting closer, the last one I just read, it's getting closer to the uh, Greek. 
In the original Greek, the word for flaw, uh, perfect is usually from the word uh, strong number 5048, tele, teleo, if that's how you pronounce it, related to another word that means complete, mature, finished, to make perfect by reaching the intended goals. It points to finishing your work or duty. You're complete. You're mature. Remember those words as being the primary Greek meaning that we're going to read in the New Testament on the word uh, perfect. Vine's Expository Dictionary says something pretty much the same thing, to bring something to an end, to complete the intended result. That's more the meaning of perfect in the Greek. So the word we're reading as perfect in the English, we have to translate in our mind, and many of the newer translations do say mature or um, uh, finished, complete, because that is the intended meaning of the word. It's very important we get that. Very important we get that. The word perfect we're reading in English can often mean flawless, but in the Greek it means more complete, finished, mature, reach the goal. It does not, and when referring to us humans, mean flawless. If my friend could have only understood that, he would understand, first of all, he's never going to be flawless by his own effort, even with the Holy Spirit. Even Paul said, even with the Holy Spirit, I still do stuff I don't want to do. <clears throat> So though Yeshua was flawless, and with as many advantages he had over us, no other human being surely would claim to be flawless day in, day out on their spiritual life. Even Apostle Paul made it really clear. Go back and read the last half of Romans 7. I might, if I have time in part 2, read it with you. Where he says, sometimes I still, that, I still do the things I, I, I don't want to do, the things I hate. And then he says something, We'll cover maybe next time more. It's no longer I doing it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, that's an interesting, I, you don't hear sermons on that. We should. In Philippians 3, verses 13 to 14, Paul also makes it clear. This is very close to his final years of life. In the New Living Translation, Philippians 3, 13, 14, I don't mean to say I've already achieved the things that I'm talking about or, or that I've already reached perfection. He says, don't get that impression that I'm, he says, I'm pushing hard for I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus has possessed me. I press on. I want it. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Holman says, not that I've already reached the goal or am already fully mature. So we'll come back to those in more detail later on, maybe in part two as well. Scripture is very clear. Humans are imperfect often even outright failures on a minute-by-minute, day-by-day basis. We fail on different things. Even apostles, ministers, prophets, Bible-dedicated people. We fail. I fail. I feel very badly when I do, when I sin. Look what Jacob said. Jacob was Israel. When the Pharaoh asked him how old he was, in Genesis 47, verse 9, let's read it. Genesis 47, verse 9, Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of, my, of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years, 130 years, few and evil, few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. I can relate to Jacob. Can you? Jacob says, my life, disappointing. It's been really disappointing. I look at my life, if I dwell on me, on my life, I get depressed, discouraged. When I dwell on Yeshua and realize I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, I feel more lifted up. Certainly when I look back at my life, frankly, I feel like an abject failure in so much of my life in the past 20, 30 years ago, especially as a Christian, as a minister, as a father, as a brother. But I'm not alone. So many of you ask out loud, I wonder if I'll ever make it into God's kingdom. I wonder if I'll ever qualify. Well, keep listening, because we're talking about all that today. You will be in God's kingdom. But certain understanding has to be in place first. You need something else. You need the Holy Spirit, which is God's very presence inside of you. The whole concept of becoming perfect 
as God is perfect, is not possible without a spirit essence inside of us. Peter calls it God's divine nature. Let's put it up there, Second Peter 1, 4, divine nature. And in 1 Peter 1, 23, he calls the Holy Spirit God's seed, the divine seed, the divine nature. So the Holy Spirit puts God's very nature now into me and into you. It doesn't take away the old nature. In the middle of Galatians 5, before he gets into the uh, uh, fruits of the Spirit and the works of the flesh, he mentions how these two war against each other. We have like two hearts inside of the old carnal heart that's deceitful above all things. And we have the new heart from God that is not deceitful, that is not evil. It's from God. Even David said, create in me a clean heart. Give me a new one. Restore the right spirit within me. But now we have two natures. And that's why we have these conflicts. Because inside of us, like who was it? Was it uh, Rebecca? Yeah, Rebecca said when she was getting ready, when she was carrying uh, Jacob and Esau, she says, I feel like two whole nations are inside of me. And that's really what it is. There's the kingdom of Satan and his world, his ways. And there's the kingdom of God and his ways. And these two war against each other. And they're in, that's inside of us. And the one that we give power to, the one we feed, the one we pay attention to, will be the one that grows. So we're told to repent, turn from our former ways, turn to God. We're told after that, and this is what Peter said in Acts 2, verse 36 to 39, when they said, oh my, what can we do? We've killed the Messiah. What can we do? Peter's response in Acts 2, 38 was repent for the remission of your, and be baptized for the remission of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit. So none of this sermon will work unless you have God's Spirit. Why? Because you have zero chance of ever being complete or perfect trying to get there without God's presence in you. Now, if you're not baptized, if, if you make sure you repent first, which means not just saying you're sorry, but turning from your evil way back to God. If you haven't been baptized, let's find a way to get that fixed. If you wish to learn more about water immersion, which is what baptism means, baptizo means immerse. Not sprinkled on the head, immersed. I do have a sermon in here. Just go to the search, go to the home page on the right side where it says search. Then type in baptisms. And just wait a couple seconds and you'll see it. You see the sermons pop up, or a sermon from 2011 about the doctrine of baptisms. So be sure you get baptized by a spirit filled minister and be sure he lays hands on you afterwards. Ask God to give you the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, I do hear expressions in the church among brethren. I wonder if I'll ever make it. I wonder if I'll ever qualify for the kingdom of God. Do you ever say that? Frankly, that shows a huge misunderstanding of how we qualify and who does it and how we, quote unquote, make it into the kingdom. I know there were ministers 20, 30 years ago who used terms like qualifying and making it and all of that. And I think it really hurt the understanding of God's grace that keeps working for us. Even long after baptism, even long after we've turned from sin to a way of life of obey, obeying God, although we still stumble. And again, no matter what you've been, no matter what you've done or been, God has a plan for you, a very exciting one. He's going to finish what he's starting in you. But let me jump ahead here just for a second. Let's go to Colossians 1, verses 12 to 14. Let me put your mind at ease right now about this, because look what it says right here. The King James Version here is very awkward. The King James in verse 12 says, The Father who has made us meet to be partakers of, it's hard to wrap your brain around that. 
Colossians 1, verses 12 to 14, the New King James, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified, past tense, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, has qualified us. Are, are you getting it? Okay. So, verse 13, he has delivered, past tense again, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. That's why we, we want nothing to ever do with All Saints Day, All Souls Day, Halloween, Samhain, over there in England, Ireland, Scotland. They, they have funny Halloween traditions that are not funny. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the conveyed, past tense. He has delivered us, has conveyed us, has qualified us. I'm not saying it, the Bible's saying it. Has conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. It's God's kingdom, God the Father's kingdom, who in turn bequeaths it to the Son. So there are several verses that talk about the kingdom of Christ. It's not just the kingdom of God, it's the kingdom of Christ. And He will in turn bequeath it to us. It will be my kingdom, it'll be your kingdom. The kingdom of God is... Anyway, that's another subject I get so excited about. This is the good news. That Jesus came and died and bled for us and washed away our sins and opens the door for us to come into the kingdom of God as first fruits, first, first resurrected. Anyway, kingdom, the son of his love, verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Redemption, you've been redeemed. We have it already. The forgiveness of sins. When we read other passages, we see that bringing us into God's kingdom from start to finish is God's work. It's God's work. And as you'll see, perfection, becoming mature and complete, and eventually in God's eyes, flawless, once the end is attained, is God's work. It's an act of God. You can read also Romans 8, 29 and 30, where we see that God foreknew us, predestined us, called us, justified, that means declared righteous, glorified, all past tense, it's very important that you grasp this. That God sees this as already done. I'm going to explain why in another minute, so be patient. Romans 8, 29, 30. For whom he foreknew, you and me, foreknew. Now he told Jeremiah that, what does he say, that before you were even formed, I already had you in mind. Paul says, my, I, I was consecrated from my mother's womb. Galatians 1, somewhere in there, 19 or so. But anyway, so let's read it. Romans 8, 29 and 30. Whom he foreknew, whom he also predestined to be conformed. Notice all the past tenses here. To the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined. You've been predestined. I'm going to talk about that soon. Don't panic. It's a, it's a wonderful topic. These he also called, and he's the one who does the calling. He's the one who calls us first, opens our mind first, and we have to respond. Whom he called, these he also justified, that means declared righteous. Got it? And whom he justified, these he also glorified. We read right through those. I've heard ministers just blast right through that verse and miss the fact these are all past tense. How can that be? Praise God. God predestined me and you. He called you and me. He knew ahead of time. He knew us ahead of time. Maybe before we were born in many cases. He justified us. Now how does that happen? Let's put up Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10. Because God is like an architect. I've got all, if I'm an architect and I've got all these beautiful plans on paper of what the house is going to look like inside and out and things you can see and can't see and Every detail of it. I see exactly what this house is going to be like. Exactly. So I can tell you now, while right now there's just trees and dirt out there, what a house is going to look like because I'm the architect. I can see the end from the beginning. Hallelujah. Praise God. Because that's what he does. Isaiah 46 verses 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old. For I am God. There's no other. I am God. There's no one like me. 
verse 10, declaring, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. You might notice that Genesis talks about a garden. In the very last chapter of the Bible talks about garden and the trees of life. And, okay. The end from the beginning. I hope you're starting to feel some hope that God knows you. God not only knows you, he picked you, called you, predestined you, qualified you, delivered you into the kingdom of his dear son, all past tense, because he sees, like the architect does, the end product that he's shooting for from the beginning. <clears throat> now here's a verse we'll continue to build on as we get from this point. The, the tenses were all past tense. Now look at Hebrews 10, verse 14, King James Version. For by one offering, God, he has perfected or hath, hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. By one offering, now Paul says he hadn't figured he'd attained yet. The one writing the book of Hebrews, whether it was Paul or Barnabas or whoever it was, is remembering the concept that God declares the end from the beginning. And he says right here, by one offering, he has perfected Past tense. He has perfected forever them that are sanctified, set apart for holy use. The NIV says, for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. Are you feeling it? <laughs> Am I speaking out just to nobody out there? Are you feeling it, what it's saying here? And you always ask yourself, I wonder if I'll ever qualify. I wonder if I'll ever make it. I wonder. It means you don't understand what I'm talking about here yet. You need to understand this. God's own righteousness is credited to us. I've spoken on that so many times. So many of you continue to reject it. Part of the way we understand perfection, we have to remember we are part of the body of Yeshua, part of the body of the Son of God. 1 Corinthians 12, go back and read it. Some of us, our mouths or, or hands or toes or elbows or hair or fingernails or whatever we are, we're part of the body of Christ. So if we're part of his body, how can anything that's part of his body be anything but holy, clean, and pleasing. Even dirt becomes holy when God's there. Remember when Moses was standing on the dirt? Take your shoes off, Moses. Show a little respect. For I am here. The ground is holy. The ground on which you stand is holy ground. Dirt can be holy. You and I are dirt. Okay, that's what flesh and blood started at, out as. Dirt, dust. God in us makes us holy. So when we sin, we should feel awful and repent deeply. Now Paul also says that in Christ, Ephesians 2, 6, write that down, look it up later, we sit in the heavenlies on the right side of God in Christ. Because I am in Christ and because you are in Christ, who is sitting on the right hand of God, Paul says that means so am I. I, so are you sitting in the heavenlies in Christ on the right hand of God. We need to be understanding this. This perfection we've been called to is directly tied into the concept of God crediting his righteousness to us. It's called the righteousness which is by faith. Galatians 5.5, 5, Romans 5.15-21. Five, I'll, I'll put these verses up and you can write them down as you see them up there. Let's leave them up there for a while. Hebrews 11, 7. Noah became heir of the righteousness that is according to faith. So this is not a new covenant, New Testament thing. No one knew about the righteousness that is according to faith. God cannot accept just our own best efforts because even with the Holy Spirit, 
as Paul said in Romans 7, it won't be complete. It won't be flawless. It won't be like God perfectly enough. So remember Paul, about 20 some years after his conversion, wrote all that in Romans 7, that he still sometimes did the things he didn't want to do. Paul also makes it clear in Philippians 3, verses 9 to 11. I've read this verse so many times. Let's read it again. He says, you know what? All these wonderful things that I, I thought were so magnificent. You know, I, I, I was trained by G G Gamaliel. I was a Pharisee. I was very uh, careful about the law. Blameless about the law, he even says. And I was getting all these accolades. I was really somebody. And then God called me here and all that stuff in my past, in the King James was so much dung, so much cow poop, dog poo. He says, I want to give all that up, all I want now. Let's read it. Verse 9, that I may gain Christ. Philippians 3, verse 9 to 11, be found in him, not not having my own righteousness from the law, but that righteousness, that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, know Yeshua, and the power of his resurrection. I want him to live again in me. I want to know his resurrection is being demonstrated inside of me. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I might attain the resurrection from the dead. Now, we're simply not going to be in the kingdom on our own great performances, folks. It's simply falls two ways short. Paul goes on, of course, in verse 12, 13, 14 to say, I don't think that I've already attained that. We, this was now over 30 years, I believe, past his conversion, when he says, look, I'm not there yet, but I'm Pressing on, not giving up. But in another way of looking at it, Hebrews 10, 14 says, one offering he has perfected us forever, those of us who are being called to be holy. By one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Paul says, okay, when I look at my life, though, I realize I still fail. But God's looking at the architectural drawings of you in the end, okay? Okay. So Paul realizes in verse 9 of Philippians 3, he wanted God's righteousness, the best God could do, not the best he could do. So Father offers us what I call the big swap. 2 Corinthians 5.21. God says, give me everything you've got, all your sins, all your filth, all your pride, all your vanity, all your accomplishments. Give me everything you've got. Sin, everything, your vanity, everything. And I want to give you everything I've got including his righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, God, made him who knew no sin, that's Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Not just a sin offering, but he took our sin upon himself, that we might become the righteousness of God. How? In him, in Christ. We really have to understand what it means to be in Christ. Yeshua took, him, took on himself everything that was bad in us. And by doing so, he incurred the wrath of God, the darkness and the lightning and the earthquake and the anger of God because every sin ever committed by every human was put on this flawless man. He took the separation that sin causes. Your sins are what separate you from God, one of the verses says. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, verse 1, he said that on the cross. He took our rejection. Even his own people rejected him, remember? Remember? tribe of Judah rejected him. The human race rejected him. The man who actually betrayed him 
we say the name Judas and miss the point. Judas was the Hellenized, the Greek, the Greek form of Yehuda or Judah. His real name was not Judas, but Judah or Yehuda. The man who betrayed him was Judah. And then before Pilate, Pilate gave them a choice. He said, look, you can have Yeshua, Jesus, in whom I find no fault, and who was the Son of God, the Son of God the Father, or you can have an imposter, Barabbas. Bar means son of. Abbas, again, is the Greek form of the Aramaic Abba, the Father. So standing there before the crowd was the real son of God and the imposter, son of Abba, Barabbas. And the pain that they picked him. And in his love, God gave us Yeshua's perfect life, full of love, compassion, forgiveness, acceptance of us. So in spite of us, he became sin for us. And he took away our sins, not just that one time, but for forever and ever. Not just the time from when you were baptized, but every time you sin since then, he will wash away yesterday's sins, this morning's sins, last night's sins. He will wash them away. So in Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I, I, it's not me who lives anymore. I've been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who loved me, even me. Even I can say that. Paul felt that he was the least of all the saints because he had persecuted and sent men to their death for their belief in Yeshua. Who loved me and gave himself for me, Paul says. So now in Colossians 3, verse 3 and 4, for you died. Your life is hidden. The old you, even the new you. God says, let's hide it. It's hidden with Christ, who is also in God. So when Christ, who is our life, appears, let that really sink in who your life really is. You were dead in your sins, and then he brought you up in the resurrection, pictured by the baptism coming out of the water, and then he had hands laid upon you, and Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, came and became your life. Then you also will appear with him in glory. If you don't accept this, if you don't believe it, then John 3.36 happens to you. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. Again, seeing the end from the beginning, he who does not believe in the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. When we sin or have sin, we come under wrath. Yeshua, Jesus, takes that away. If we don't accept and let him do that, then we're still in the wrath of God. So make sure you understand what it means to give your sins to Christ and accept the righteousness of God by faith. We all still fall short, though, in the meantime. Now, I want to start a concept here. Almost tempted to stop here, but let's go a few more minutes. We know Jesus is and was perfect. But why does this, why is this said in Hebrews 2, verse 10? It was fitting for him, from, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many children to glory, many sons to glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect, talking about Jesus, to make the captain of their salvation perfect. How? Through sufferings. The, here the word perfect is the same word I've been talking about before. Mature, complete, finished. Christ was perfected through sufferings. But wasn't he already perfect and flawless? How then was he perfected if he was already perfect? Here's where the other meanings from the Greek 
for perfect come in. The Greek word for perfect means to mature, to be completed, to be finished. Okay? Here's, I think, what was going on. Yeshua was the Word of God. For eternity before he came, he was the Word of God. He was the Logos. But he never, he, he, he created Adam... He, he breathed into Adam. That was Yeshua. He, the Bible is very clear that God created all things through Yeshua. Okay? Through Yeshua. John 1, 1, 3 and Hebrews 1, 1 and 3. Anyway, and so many other places. Ephesians, what is it? 3, 3 17, I think it is. I'm, I, I shouldn't quote that. I, I, it's, it's in Ephesians. That God created through Jesus. So here he was. He made everything. He knew the tolerances. He knew what pain, he designed pain and relief from pain. He designed flesh and blood, but he'd never been for 30 some years of his life, maybe 33 years, born as a baby, fully dependent on his mom and dad at birth. Prior to that, had he ever experienced hunger? Had he ever been tempted to sin, to lie, to be overly angry, to lust after a woman? Bending over too far? You know what I mean. Had he ever experienced torture? Severe pain? Scourging? Crucifixion? Had he ever experienced total abandonment? As a human, he'd experience it as God. Israel abandoned God many times. The Bible also says that even the Aaronic priesthoods were able to have compassion on others because they were subject to weaknesses. That's in Hebrews 5. Verses 1 and 2, they were human. They understood failure. And so it says this about Yeshua, that everything he went through basically was preparing him to be more complete and experienced from this human life to be a priest who can really understand pain and all the things that we go through, emotional pain and physical pain. So Hebrews 5, verses 7 to 9, says, who in the days of his flesh, when he'd offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death and was heard because of his God. He was heard, but the message back to Jesus was, hey, we, we got to go through it, though. I'm here. I'll send an angel to encourage you, but you've got to go through it. Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Now, that cannot mean that before this time he had been disobedient or else he could not have been my savior. But he learned obedience even here where he was pleading with his father. Is there not some other way? Do I have to drink this cup? And then very quickly, won't let that turn into a temptation. Very quickly, but not my will, but yours be done, father. So he learned obedience including, I've got to go through this, by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. So this perfect here clearly points Christ, adding some elements he didn't have before, uh, being able to understand you and me when we, he probably lost his father, Joseph, his uh, earthly father, <coughs> and the pain and suffering from that. Hebrews 7.28 for the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses, but, but the word of oath, Hebrews 7, 28, which came after the law, appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. He's been perfected. He's been completed forever. I'm going to go into far more of, of this into the part two. We'll continue the role of suffering, why you suffer, why why there's death and pain and disappointment and failure and what looks like unanswered prayer sometimes and how all of that plays such a big role, such a big role in being perfected. Because you and I, just like Yeshua, has become a more complete high priest, perfected high priest by the things he suffered, as I've just read. You and I are also being trained right now in this life to be more complete priests under our high priests by the things we will go through as well. So we see God is perfect. People are not. Jesus was perfect, an exact copy of his Father. We are not. 
so far, but we will be. And we also understand that perfect can often mean in the New Testament complete, mature, finished, completed, and flawless when referring to God. God declares the end from the beginning. He knows what he's going to do in you. He knows what he's going to finish in you. Sometimes we make it a little tough for him, but he will finish it. I'm going to show you that next time. And we've seen how suffering as a flesh and blood human added elements to Christ's experience that he hadn't had before. It completed him for his role as a high priest. Suffering will complete us as well. So let's finish this in part two next time. And next time we'll cover much more of the vital role of suffering and pain and how it's a part of the program. And we'll cover who makes sure that we end up perfect. And how does that happen? When does it happen? So, Father in heaven, we dismiss now. We ask your dismissal. We just ask in Yeshua's mighty name that you, Father, will just wake us up, frankly. Wake us up. Too many of us are just going through the motions of life and we're not really all that earnest. Yeshua, you ask, will you find faith on the earth when you come back? Please find it in your people. Fill us with your faith. Fill us with your love. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your love. The greatest gift of all, your love. Faith and hope. Love, the greatest of these. Watch over us. Give us your divine protection over this whole horrible COVID thing going around. Protect us, Father. Some people are dying. Some people in, among the brethren are dying from it. So protect us from that and help us to seek you, to pray more, to do everything we can to get zealous. Be turned to you. Be happy with us, Father. Please help us come to that point where we can make you happy, O oh God in heaven. God in heaven, we just ask you now to hear this prayer. Send down your holy anointing Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, Yeshua's name, amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.